Welcome to County Report this week. I'm Lorna Vergelli. Thank you for joining us. Leaders from Montgomery and Fairfax counties came together recently for a meeting where they talked about one of this area's greatest challenges. Our Susan Kennedy has more on this story. Susan? Lorna, this was a historic meeting, the first of its kind between the Montgomery County Council and the Fairfax Board of Supervisors. And not surprisingly enough, the discussion focused around transportation. Traffic knows no jurisdictional boundaries. And one of the truest examples of this is the American Legion Bridge, which connects Montgomery County with Fairfax, Virginia. Leaders from both communities had a serious discussion about solving our transportation challenges. This is something that our two counties, while we're fierce competitors, we can be good collaborators when it comes to addressing the number one quality of life issue for our two respective communities. So we need to work together to deal with the traffic issue. And we've got this bridge that symbolizes the, the direct link between us. And that bridge is not a good situation right now and it's only going to be made worse by the fact that in Virginia they are expanding capacity on their side of the beltway and then you're going to get to that bridge and it's not going to be real good. We actually got down to some nitty-gritty issues as to how we improve our, our transportation connections and we've never done that. Uh, and that was a really good first step. And we also got, we had the advantage of some of the work of the Council of Governments uh, that looked at, or has looked at, it turns out, uh, a regional bus network that's worth considering. Uh, and we had an opportunity to gather to raise important issues, like how the heck we pay for any of this. But it's not just the bridge that has seen an increase in traffic. The Maryland State Highway Administration is currently looking at adding lanes along I-270 through the Beltway to the bridge, but the cost of that would be well into the billions of dollars. Though no clear answers came about from the meeting, leaders agree it was a step in the right direction. Did we solve any problems? No, but I think we, we focused on a work set of work issues that are critical to the region, probably the most important ones of all. I'm Susan Kennedy for County Report This Week. Several local and state officials participated in a forum at the Long Branch Community Center to discuss the recent Health Enterprise Zone initiative that was passed during this year's legislative session. The law budgets $4 million to create and support two to four health enterprise zones in areas with existing health disparities among minority groups. The program aims to attract physicians to underserved areas. We have about 120,000 people in Montgomery County without health insurance. Um, and of course there's great disparities. Um, in the Hispanic community more than 19 percent of people have no health insurance. In the African American community uh, about 23 percent of people have no health insurance. So, um, so it's very important that we make this case to the state government that this health enterprise zone program which is intended to eliminate health disparities that we get a pilot project here in Montgomery County. We know how to do this. We can make it work. We can put the money into patient care right away. Healthcare studies show that Hispanics have the highest uninsured rates of any racial or ethnic group in the United States. But county council members are hoping the recent decision by the Supreme Court to uphold the Affordable Health Care Act will provide the local Latino community more access to care. Iris Argueta has more on the story. Elba Subia thinks twice about going to the doctor because of the cost of medical care. Que cuesta mucho los, uh, los seguros, cuesta mucho la, la consulta, cuesta el, los laboratorios. But patients like Elba and millions of other uninsured Latino residents will now get access to care at more affordable rates through the Affordable Health Care Act. We are one of the communities that's the most underinsured, and so 9 million Latinos stand to benefit from the Affordable Care Act. Latinos of all income levels who are uninsured will have access to health insurance through the Affordable Health Care Act. And Obama administration officials at the recent White House Hispanic Community Action Summit in Maryland encouraged Hispanics in Montgomery County to take advantage of the law, which was signed by the president in 2010. Sometimes our community doesn't know that, that the initiatives and policies that this administration has fought hard for affect them because it doesn't say the Latino Affordable Care Act or the Latino race to the top. But the reality is, is that everything that this president has done and every initiative that he has passed has a tremendous impact on our community. 
The Affordable Care Act includes access to free preventive care and eliminates co-payments for preventive services. Dr. Izquierdo of the Care for Your Health Clinic in Silver Spring wishes more young Latinos would use this benefit. I cannot tell you how many times in our door-to-door um, -door program we find really young people with advanced disease. So my hope, and let's see how it goes, but my hope is that by mandating everybody having an insurance, people would be more willing to engage in preventive activities. Thank God that the Supreme Court decision ensures that finally Montgomery County will get help from the federal government and from the state government in making sure that everyone has access to health care. This is about human dignity and it's about what really, um, what are the primary values of this great country. For County Report this week, Iris Argueta. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services also says the Affordable Health Care Act will provide more preventive services to nearly 4 million Latino elderly and disabled patients who receive health coverage through Medicare. Executive Lega was part of a press conference where organizers of the Salvadoran American Festival made announcements regarding the free event to be held in Wheaton. The festivities will support the first annual Latino Health Fair. The stage is ready at the Wheaton Triangle. The first Salvadoran American Festival will take place on Sunday, August 5th. And the county executive who visited El Salvador last year is more than enthusiastic about the community free event that it continues to enhance our reputation as a community that literally represents and welcomes people from all over the world. And our Salvadorian community is an integral part of that. So come out and celebrate with them and celebrate with us and have a wonderful, wonderful time. Aside from the traditional showcase of crafts, live music and food, the festival will hold a Latino health fair to provide over 20 health screenings and information on how to access state and community-based services. We're having about 20 different tests and screenings that will be available free of charge. We're having a dental bus for children from Muddy Center, uh, incredible support from the healthcare community. It is estimated that Montgomery County is home to approximately 56,000 Salvadorans. The festival will take place on Sunday, August 5th at the Wheaton Triangle from noon to 6 p.m. When we come back, County Council discusses wedges for service workers. And there are some newly repaved roads throughout the county. We'll tell you more in this transportation update. Montgomery County is looking for a few good men and women and teenagers too to help with the county fair. Volunteers are needed to give out information, get the fairgrounds ready, organize games for small children, and prepare and serve food. The possibilities are endless, but you have to sign up now to volunteer in August. Call 301-926-3100 or visit MCAG Fair to find out more. Be a part of the county fair and this year, volunteer. Welcome back to County Report This Week. I'm Lorna Vergelli. We have news on a bill that would ensure low-wage service workers will have temporary job protections when their employer's service contract is terminated. It's a measure that has divided the council. Those who support it held a press conference this week. They say the bill provides protection for those low-income workers who could be harmed by interruptions in their income. It essentially gives uh, service workers, some of the lowest paid workers in the county, a 90-day notice if their employer decides to vacate a contract. And it's been in place in the District of Columbia for 18 years with no problem. And so when you uh, sponsor legislation, one of the first things you do is you do research to see where the bill is in practice and whether or not there are any issues in, involved in it. And we've had this bill since last June. It's been over a year. And I went to the chair of the HHS committee in May and asked, the bill, asked for the bill to be put on the committee agenda. And it's August, and it, it didn't go to committee until yesterday. So clearly, there are members of the council who would rather not see this kind of uh, worker-friendly legislation be passed in Montgomery County, but I am going to uh, see this through to the end. However, Council President Roger Berliner says the bill needs work. It was 
actually extraordinary to have a work session on Monday and bring it to full council on Tuesday. So only if everybody was really very comfortable was I going to be comfortable with that. Uh, once I understood that a majority of people weren't comfortable, then it made it clear to me that we don't need to rush this. There is no emergency situation that calls for us to rush it, and we need to be thoughtful legislators and approach it in that manner. And now we get our police update from Officer Danielle Smith, who's going to talk to us about a Twitter session. Officer? That's correct, Lorna. As many of our residents know, the police department has been on Twitter for just over one year now, and we currently have approximately 2,500 followers. Recently, in an effort to expand our social media efforts, we invited the public to tweet our account and had Captain Didone answer their cam speed camera and traffic-related questions. We invited our followers to ask Captain Didone any questions that they may have regarding traffic, and he spent approximately one hour of his time answering our followers' questions. During this time, he answered questions about slowing down for speed cameras, cutting through parking lots to avoid traffic signals, and who sets speed limits on our county roads. We thank all of our followers who participated in this tweet session, and we encourage everyone to follow us at MyMCP News in order to hear about your police department news and also to stay tuned for more tweet sessions with Captain Didone and other police department officials. Great new tool. Thank you, Officer Smith, for that update. Here's Tom Polk from the county's Department of Transportation with an update on road repaving that took place. Tom? Hi, I'm Tom Pogue, Community Relations Manager for the Department of Transportation. Here's an update from Montgomery County. MCDOT received over $15 million in stimulus funding to improve our transportation infrastructure and help jumpstart our economy. County Executive Leggett, federal, state, and local officials celebrated the completion of the road repaving project that used $6.7 million in American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funding. Seven roads were selected because of their deteriorated condition. The improvements involved segments totaling 43 miles of Barnesville Road, Old Columbia Pike, Shady Grove, Randolph, Forest Glen, Trevilla, and Whitman Roads. Highway services replaced defective curbs, gutters, sidewalks, and pavement surfaces, poured hot mix asphalt, and installed reflective lane markings. These funds also employed 50 people, 47 by the paving contractor, and three contracted county inspectors. Other MCDOT stimulus money funded improved traffic and pedestrian safety investments and 13 new energy efficient buses. For more information, go to our website at montgomerycountymd.gov recovery. We're working to keep you moving. When we come back, the Redskins visit our county. And Montgomery College has a new soccer coach. We'll be right back. Welcome back to County Report this week on Lorna Vergelli. Just two days before training camp began, the Washington Redskins 80th anniversary tour bus made a stop in Montgomery County. My MC Media's Sonia Burke reports. The Washington Redskins 80th anniversary tour made a stop here in Silver Spring. Along for the ride, Dexter Manley and Charles Mann. The two football greats, who have both won Super Bowl rings, addressed young campers at the Mid-County Recreation Center, where they stressed the importance of staying active. We're going to get these kids moving around. There's opportunities for us to show the, the fans and the people of this community that we care, and this is a great way to do it. You know, this is a great franchise. It's been around 80 years, and we could not have done it without their parents, their grandparents, and their foreparents, and so it just trickled down, and so everybody's giving back, and I want to be a part of it. Also on the Skins Thank You Tour, two current players, the cheerleaders, and the Hoggettes. Redskins Nation host Larry Michael called the visit a homecoming. I want fans to know that I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland, and I love being here. My mom lives up the street. I grew up in Four Corners, and 
not very often we get a chance to come to Silver Spring and bring our TV show here and see the fans here and see some familiar faces. I feel at home. During the event, the kids played field day type games and they learned a lot more about the Redskins. They asked me what is it like to be a Redskins cheerleader. Everybody wants to know about RG3. If I, do I know RG3? Have I met RG3? What's he like? And so the answer to most of those questions is yes, he's a great guy. The Skins visit was a summer highlight for more than just the kids. I've been a Redskins fan my entire life and to have a position where I can create these kinds of partnerships and spread messages that are positive like this and, and help provide a mechanism for kids to have these kinds of opportunities, I can't think of anything better. And the athletes want the kids to know that there's more to life than just playing ball. I haven't played football in 16 years, but my character is is what's gotten me out here, has people wanting to see me at certain events. And if we can just build character in, the, in this team and these young athletes, they'll, 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 they'll make their mamas proud. In Silver Spring, I'm Sonia Burke reporting. There's a new era about to begin in Montgomery College men's soccer, and MCTV's Michael Brown has the details. The Montgomery College men's soccer team has a new head coach, and for the first time in school history, they've gone outside the program to make their pick. Pedro Braz is the choice, and he's the first MC men's soccer coach who did not play at the college prior to coaching here. But Braz comes to MC with an impressive resume. I went to UNH, uh, University of New Hampshire. I uh, played four years there, had a really, really great time. Um, I remember two out of the four years we were ranked regionally, and then uh, my junior year, I remember we were ranked top 25 in the country. After college, he played first division soccer in both Angola and Puerto Rico, and then the USL here in the States. Then coaching beckoned. Even since I was younger, I always knew that was my path. Like I was, I was a decent player, but uh, even when I was yay high, I was six, seven years old, I kind of knew I always wanted to be affiliated with the sport and I always knew I can somewhat tap into people and kind of motivate them, so coaching was always my final goal. So after serving as an assistant coach at Dean College in Massachusetts for three years, the allure of the MC opening enticed him. The history of M MC soccer period, it's, it's phenomenal. From, um, uh, I, I could take it back from years when, when, when Coach Tom was here, and he, and he was here for 32 years, and that was before Coach Steve. Um, both of them, again, I uh, want to salute both coaches. They were phenomenal, and they're legends here at MC, and, and, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to continue that here. And he begins his tenure with definite goals in mind. I think I'm ready, and, then, uh, and I think I'm the man for the job for it. So uh, my uh, two goals here is to get these student athletes one through through school and get and leave here with an associate's degree and further their academic career more than the soccer and um and then win and he's eager to get out on the pitch I, again I'm, I'm ready i'm ready to go i'm ready to go i'm anxious i'm uh, i'm uh ready to meet the play the returning players and then the new players coming so i'm ready to take on the challenge and i feel like i'm prepared and, and ready for it and uh i think we should have a, a successful season at the end of each school year, there are countless new and used supplies left over from local schools. Many of those items end up in the hands of those who need them most. For more on that story, we go to Richard Montgomery High School. Binders, pens, crayons, folders, and pencils. These are just some of the free supplies hundreds of families in need and nonprofit organizations got to take home from the MCPS and Learn Shop Inc. Drive for Supplies event. For 13 years, MCPS has distributed new and gently used school supplies. This year, more than 13,000 pounds of supplies were collected from MCPS students and staff who donate as they clean out lockers, desks and closets at the end of the school year. It is so important that we continue to do everything we can in our county to help support those who need a little help. Every little bit helps. You might only have one box of collected supplies, but the things that are in that one box might make a really big difference to somebody. Student volunteers spend several days in the summer sorting and repackaging the supplies, learning about the importance of giving back and recycling. If you volunteer, you can volunteer throughout your whole life and know that I've done something great with my life even though it was small. For some, this program offers much needed support in these tough economic times. For our, a lot of our families, it's a relief so that they have something for their children for school. A lot of them just don't have it to do and this helps them. 
This program has distributed more than 55 tons of supplies since 2002, and Board of Education President Shirley Brandman hopes that number will continue to grow. We've had 61 schools participate, which is great, but we're a county of 200 schools, and we really hope that every school will take to heart this wonderful program that's a win-win on every level. That's a great way to help students meet their needs as they prepare for the upcoming school year. The 2012 National Night Out Annual Observance will take place on Tuesday, August 7th. National Night Out is designed to generate neighborhood support of and participation in crime prevention efforts and to enhance police and community relations. Along with a traditional display of outdoor lights and front porch vigils, many communities celebrate with a variety of events to help neighbors get to know one another and to build community spirit. County Executive Ike Leggett and Police Chief Tom Manger, along with the members of the police department's command staffs, will be attending many of the night out observances throughout the county. For a full list of locations, please visit mymcpnews.com. When we come back, we take you to an art exhibit in Rockville. And we travel back to the Civil War. Stay tuned. New MC students should plan to attend one of the new student orientation sessions scheduled in August on all three campuses. Learn about student life activities, counseling services, financial aid, and much more. If you're a working adult and want to go places in business, then enroll today in MC's Accelerated Business Program. Learn essential business concepts in a program designed for adults to complete their degree within two years. And the credits are transferable to four-year schools. Pedro Braz has been named the new men's soccer coach at MC. Braz arrives with an impressive resume. He played four years for the nationally ranked University of New Hampshire team and also played in Angola and Puerto Rico. And he served as an assistant coach for NJCAA Division I powerhouse, Dean College. For more information about the endless possibilities at your community college, visit our website. Welcome back to County Report this week. I'm Lorna Virgili. Rockville 11's Ali Kiva visited the Rockville Senior Center to talk to artist Pierre Ruffoul about his popular exhibit. Here's the story. The show was very, very well re received, way past my expectation. A member of the Senior Center, Pierre Ruffoul was pleased to see his artwork being enjoyed by the community. First of all, it's a beautiful place for me to show my stuff, my guide as I call them. Uh, people keep coming several times, some of them. Some people stayed one hour the first time they came, came back again. People came from all over. Rafael has worked with many different mediums and is well known for his photography. But he discovered a new passion when he began working with the Japanese art of wabi-sabi. But what exactly is wabi-sabi? Wabi-sabi is the Japanese art of finding beauty in imperfection, profoundity in nature, of accepting the natural cycle of growth, decay, and death. Wabi-sabi celebrates cracks, rust, missing or broken parts, or the mark of time. It's modest, unpretentious. It's undeclared beauty waiting to be rediscovered. All the trolls, all the stands are made from recovered wood. Where did his inspiration to create his trolls come from? When I retired from work in 2010, I started taking long walks in the woods and uh, I started finding objects or dead wood, driftwood that I would turn into flower pots. Soon after that, I started finding small animal-like form that I turned into what became the trolls. And soon after, the trolls started having messages that they wanted to bring to the world. We wanted to know more about Rafaux's trolls and their messages. Uh, the trolls are trying to bring greater peace or harmony to the world. Here the message is, uh, I am resting in myself. My life flows without interruption, without doubt, without fears. I have no regret about my past. I am fully present. All my life I have been kind of looking for something special that nobody else was doing. 
and then suddenly the trolls fell into my hand and I feel like they found me rather than me finding them. And I was just, I, I became so passionate about the trolls that it was like falling in love for the first time. I mean, I was just so happy I nearly cried that suddenly what I have been looking for all my life just came to me. I think it's beautiful. It's time for another Heritage Montgomery Civil War moment. The last installment left off with a survey of the Union presence in Western Montgomery County. Continuing on, the focus turns to the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Welcome to Violet's Lock, one of 74 locks found along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Today, the CNO is our longest national park. It runs nearly 184 miles from Georgetown to Cumberland, Maryland. It draws close to 4 million visitors each year. But during the Civil War, this was an important supply line for the Union Army. At the outset of the war, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal had just been completed. Comprised of a series of locks, aqueducts, and culverts to accommodate changing elevations, the CNO was a critical transportation link to and from the Port of Georgetown. The city of Washington depended upon it, which is why Confederates disrupted sections whenever they could. This is the recently restored Monocacy Aqueduct. Today it's a great place to hike or boat, but during the Civil War, it survived at least two known attempts by rebel soldiers to destroy it with explosives. Because the canal runs alongside the Potomac, all troops crossing the river, Union and Confederate, also had to cross the canal. The sheer numbers caused ongoing destruction. Prior to the war, the ferry that operated here at Edwards Ferry connected Virginia to Maryland. The canal is just up the hill, along with the remains of a small town. Union forces camped here throughout the war. In October 1861, Edwards Ferry was the site of a makeshift hospital that cared for soldiers wounded in the Battle of Ball's Bluff. One was a young Oliver Wendell Holmes. And in 1863, prior to the Battle of Gettysburg, General Joseph Hooker and his Army of the Potomac crossed the river into Maryland, here at Edwards Ferry using two 1,400-foot-long bridges that Union engineers had constructed from pontoons. The physical impact of this crossing on the canal and the surrounding area was enormous. For County Report This Week, I'm Barbara Grunbaum. For more of the county's involvement in the Civil War, visit the Heritage Montgomery website and click on Civil War. Now let's go to Kathy Stanhope from the Humane Society. She's looking for a home for an eight-year-old male dog. This is our Pet of the Week segment. Hi, this is Kathy Stanhope with your Pet of the Week at the Montgomery County Humane Society. And this gentleman is Beegs. That's a very original name for a beagle, but he, a beagle he is. He's a tricolored beagle, and he is in the prime of his life. He's about eight years old. We found him as a stray. And if you are a beagle owner, you have to remember beagles tend to follow their noses. And that's probably how this poor guy wound up astray. Someone let him off the leash and he followed a scent and he lost his way back and he couldn't find his way home. So if you're an experienced dog owner, this is a good dog for you because he will try to wander. But if you keep him on a leash or in a good fenced in yard, you'll keep him forever. He's got a good eight, nine, ten years in him yet. He is very sweet. If you're looking for an easy dog, this is it. He gets along well with other dogs, cats, kids. He walks beautifully on a leash. He's just the sweetest guy. And you can't tell it, but he's also very soft. He loves to be pet and cuddled. He wants to go home with you, and he needs a home. So come on down and meet Beegs here at the Montgomery County Humane Society. And remember, it's hot now. It's very hot out. Please don't take your dogs out for a ride in the car and leave them in the car. Even if you leave the window open a lot, the car gets very hot very quickly. So the dog can die, you can get a ticket. Please leave your dogs home in the air conditioning. They're much happier. So come on down though and see Beegs here at the shelter. You wanna take them home with you? Give us a call at 240-773-5967 or visit us on the web at mchumane.org. Be ready for the fair. We would like to close the show reminding you that the 64th Montgomery County Agricultural Fair will take place from August 10th through the 18th at the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in Gaithersburg. As usual, it promises to bring exciting attractions and contests with over 40 rides, plenty of food, and many family activities.
don't miss it. With that, we close this edition of County Report this week. Remember to like us on Facebook and to join us at this time every week for a look at what's going on inside Montgomery County. I'm Lorna Virgili. Thank you for watching.